Hello, and welcome to our winter tell talk with Dr. Andrew Levitt, who is going to share how collaboration deepened partnerships during the pandemic. I'm Amy Ashton from the Oshkosh Area School District and co-chair for the Oshkosh Area Emerging Leaders Group. If you're not familiar with the Oshkosh Area Emerging Leaders, the Emerging Leaders Program provides early to mid-year professionals an opportunity to further develop leadership skills, network with like-minded individuals, and elevate their commitment to making a difference in our community. You can find out more at oshkoshareaunitedway.org and we are looking for more leaders to join us for exciting opportunities in 2022. Please look into it and join. I'm so excited today to welcome you all here to learn from Chancellor Levitt. He is the 11th Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh and has served the Oshkosh United Way as the co-chair twice. Andy was the chair of the Oshkosh Area United Way with his wife, Karen, in 2019. The first chair in history of our organization that has served consecutively in 2020 with Brian Brandt from the Oshkosh Corporation. Chancellor Levitt shares a leadership with nearly 30 years as an educator, researcher, and fundraiser. His focus remains on engaging students in hands-on learning opportunities and increasing the profile of an undergraduate, graduate and faculty research at UW Oshkosh while furthering the university's commitment to sustainability. Committed to Oshkosh, Fond du Lac and Fox City's campuses and communities, Chancellor Levitt has served on a number of external boards. They include the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce Board, the Community Sounding Board, Key Executive Council, New North Incorporated Board, and the Grand Oshkosh Board. He has served as a chair of the Northeast Wisconsin Educational Resource Alliance, the New Era Board, and the Wisconsin Intercollegiate Athletic Conference Counselor, Council of Chancellors. He has a bachelor's degree of chemistry with minors in physics and mathematics from the University of Arizona in Tucson, and a PhD in chemistry from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. A native of Tucson, Arizona, Chancellor Levitt is married to Karen Levitt. They have three adult children, Genevieve and her spouse, Maple, Scott and Madeline, and two grandchildren. We are thrilled to offer this tell talk, but before I hand this over to Chancellor Levitt, there are a few housekeeping items I want to mention. Please make sure to turn off your microphone if you haven't already. During the presentation, please submit questions using the Q&A, and we'll make every effort to get all submitted questions and get to the answer. Be sure to save the date for our next Tell Talk for August 24th with Kevin Rolofsky, President and Chief Executive Officer for Verve, a credit union who will discuss creating an exceptional workplace. And now, Chancellor Levitt, welcome. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Amy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Andy Levin. I'm the chair of the Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. And I certainly want to thank the Oshkosh Area Emerging Leaders Group uh, for this honor, uh, this invitation to, to talk to you today. Uh, I, all I have to say is I really wish that I had a group a lot like this uh, when I was uh, first beginning my career. Um, um, I guess I turned out okay, but at the same time, it would have been nice to have a, a group of people that we could uh, work together on to solving some common issues. Uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh's response to uh, the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, of course, it started uh, in, um, I would, it, it started in, in, in uh, actually before March of 2020. Uh, and I think that there's uh, a lot of lessons that we have learned that I'm going to talk about today. But as I move into that, what I want to do is first is to talk a little bit about the institution so you kind of have an idea of, of who and what we are. Uh, we just finished uh, celebrating our sesquicentennial in, in this last December, this 150 year anniversary. Uh, our uh, first president uh, was George Albee. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, we started as a, as a uh, school, uh, we started as a normal school, meaning that we were here to train teachers. And we've been doing that now for more than 150 years. Uh, the campus itself was, uh, was built uh, in the 1870s uh, as, a, as a part of a bid process that we had going for the state. 
Uh, and so we very beautiful building. Uh, it was a William Waters building that many have, have seen the lithograph before, uh, where you have uh, this this towering place. Of course, that building burned down in in the 1916 and has been replaced since by uh, Dempsey Hall. Uh, the institution itself, uh, we have about 10 to 11,000 residential and, and commuting students that come on, in, on one of our any one of our three campuses. Of course, that's the Fox Cities campus, the Fond du Lac campus, and the, uh, uh, the main campus here at, at Oshkosh. Uh, our reach actually is beyond that because of our cooperative academic partnership program, or CAP, Many of you, if you've gone to high school here locally, uh, probably were in CAP classes, sometimes identified as UW classes uh, while you were in high school where you were able to receive college credit. If you add in those numbers, our numbers are closer to something along the lines of about 15,000 students uh, here. So we definitely have uh, make a big impact here in the region. So as with 15,000 students and we have about 1,700 employees, you can imagine uh, the impact of, of something like COVID uh, um, on our institution. Uh, in that uh, January to March of 2020 uh, time period, of course, we were preparing. Higher education, I think, was one of the more reactive groups of, of people uh, to the COVID outbreak uh, early on. Uh, it was the University of Washington, for instance, in Seattle, that was the very first institution to go completely online, and they went, they went online almost a month before uh, the rest of us did. So uh, we had uh, started meeting frequently as a system. Uh, Ray Cross was then was the president of the institution, uh, and he would meet, meet with us on a, actually twice a week in order for us to kind of get a game plan in place. We already were ahead of the game here at UW Oshkosh and uh, fortuitously because of an event that happened uh, a little earlier and that was the, um, the we had a, our own sort of endemic on campus and we had a norovirus outbreak in our residence hall a good year before this. Norovirus is a nasty bug that you pick up typically on cruise ships. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, we had thousands of students living in residence halls that were inflicted with norovirus. And we had to put a pandemic-like plan into practice uh, almost immediately uh, in, in that particular uh, event. We were able to work through it. Uh, and then uh, we were uh, able to uh, learn some valuable lessons. The first lesson that we learned was we needed to empower and leverage the knowledge and the talent around us. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, that means that we need to look inward at the institution. We have lots of people who are very skilled and uh, obviously higher education, you know, you're, you're on a camp college campus. There are a lot of smart people here who can do um, a lot of very capable things. So uh, in that, um, we uh, put together what we called uh, the uh, um, Emergency Operation Center which uh, interestingly enough was led by our police chief, Kurt Leibold. Uh, um, chief Leibold was a former assistant chief uh, in the, the university, excuse me, down in Milwaukee, I should say the city of Milwaukee. Uh, and so Chief Leibold was able to uh, bring a, a vast array of expertise in terms of large scale crisis management uh, to bear. So that was just very fortuitous for the institution that we had somebody on our staff who already knew how to do that. So with this EOC, and you, I see you can, you can see a, a chart of it up on the screen, uh, these are all university employees who do completely different jobs uh, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the, uh, one of our uh, very talented employees, Kim Langhoff, uh, was a director of grants uh, here on the campus, but she also happens to have a, a master's degree in microbiology. Uh, and was very schooled in a, a lot of the issues pertaining to the, the pandemic, including uh, the various forms of testing, um, antigen testing versus PCR that, uh, that um, Kim was very, very knowledgeable about that and, and can converse with people off campus in order to come to some consensus on how we, we should be approaching things. So we, uh, we put together uh, other members of the university community, and you can see them listed here, certainly people from residence life, because we had a lot of people, about 2,500 of our students live on campus. 
Um, IT obviously was a particularly important part of this with university marketing communications. Uh, the Dean of Students, uh, from the Dean of Students office, I should say that these are individuals who work with students on a daily basis on non-academic related issues. Uh, we also had a faculty member, Chad Cotty, Dr. Chad Cotty, who was a part of this, this EOC. Uh, the EOC met daily for months, months and months and months during this crisis. Uh, and then they finally, as the, as the numbers began to fall, they, they would meet weekly. Uh, now they're meeting with greater frequency because we have the Omicron variant, which is, which is hitting our campus. Uh, so we, it's about putting together the right team here on campus. And then next it's about uh, the partners. Uh, we, we needed to have um, external partners to the university in order to put together the infrastructure that would be necessary for us to navigate this. So the kind of partners we're looking at, um, uh, certainly healthcare was very, very important. And early on, um, the um, Aurora Healthcare, or Advocate Aurora, I should say, they since merged during the pandemic. Advocate Aurora was very helpful. Uh, their uh, chief medical officer and president, John, Dr. John Newman, worked with the EOC extensively to create um, a, um, certainly a, a an exodus of campus, but then also how do we get people back on campus in the following fall? So Dr. Newman uh, worked very closely with us. As a matter of fact, we asked him on two separate occasions to engage the entire uh, university community through a series of, of web presentations, uh, much like what we're doing here, where faculty and staff and students could ask questions of Dr. Newman. Uh, so it was great to be able to use this kind of local expertise. Uh, then, of course, we had Doug, Doug Guerin from the Public Health, Winnebago County Public Health Department, which was very, they were, Doug was tremendously uh, helpful in the sense that we all had the same goals in the end. And the, in the end was we wanted to keep people safe, but we also wanted to keep this university open. And so uh, aligning ourselves with public health and listening to what it is that they had to say uh, was something that was essential for our plan uh, to come to fruition. Same, of course, I would say with uh, um, um, Fond du Lac County Public Health, they did the same kind of, uh, of, of approach. The, the group that we partnered with uh, probably the most, in the most extensive way would be Prevea Healthcare. And uh, if you watch WBAY every morning, uh, that's the, the ABC affiliate out of Green Bay, You'll, you are no stranger to Dr. Ashok Rai, who comes on uh, the program frequently to talk about COVID, COVID related issues. And it was really Dr. Rai in the end who was connected with us um, through um, my boss, who's Governor Tommy Thompson. And I'll, I wanna talk about Governor Thompson a little bit later here. Uh, we, we, we were connected to Prevea and so was UW Green Bay to provide testing services for us. So uh, Dr. Rai was involved in how we were to set up our, our monitoring and testing and surveillance and, and uh, as well as the um, uh, isolation and quarantine process uh, from a very early time as well. And to this day, we still continue to work with Prevea on uh, our university testing protocols as well as vaccinations. So it was uh, once again availing ourselves of these outside partners strengthening, uh, I think, the incredible talent that we had on our campus uh, to bring together a plan uh, to keep us on, on campus. So um, when good leaders uh, ask for volunteers, you say yes. And this really started at the very beginning. Certainly, uh, I, I was, uh, was asked, to, I, as I was helping to assemble the, the EOC, those were people who dropped their day jobs in many instances and, uh, and rushed to really where the help was needed. Later on, when we were uh, recruiting in, in disease investigators and also contact tracers, uh, we asked coaches uh, in our athletic program. Uh, at that point, um, um, athletics had been pretty much suspended by the conference and they, the, there wasn't anything happening there. So we had coaches who had the capacity and the time to help us. And the coaches stepped up, for instance, and became fantastic contact tracers. So we had another 20, uh, 20, 25 people that we were able to put uh, repurpose for this task 
uh, to really uh, help with uh, the, the kind of critical work that was necessary to keep us open. And these are coaches, of course, who had no background in healthcare per se, but at the same time were, were very effective in, in what they did. We had uh, lots of examples across the entire university where, the, where they did that. So I would say um, hundreds of people at this institution volunteered to do different kinds of jobs than what they would normally be paid to do in order to uh, make all of this plan work. Tommy Thompson uh, is uh, the interim system president. A great picture of him here meeting our students. Uh, and uh, he was, as I have said publicly many times, the right person at the right time uh, for this right job. Uh, in that coming in and serving as the interim is that uh, as he started on July 1st of 2020, he infused a, a hope and a can-do attitude into uh, the entire university system that uh, at the time it was, there was very strong uh, concern that maybe we wouldn't be on, uh, we wouldn't be face-to-face -face in the fall. We were already online for the, the previous uh, spring semester. Moving through the summer, we were all working very hard to, to, to have a return to campus. We, we knew that our students needed to be on campus and it was Governor Thompson uh, who gave us uh, the confidence and uh, quite frankly, the resources uh, to do that. The first things that he would do, of course, is that, as you know, he was the former HHS secretary under President George W. Bush. Uh, the, he had uh, an amazing role, uh, Rolodex of, of contacts in Washington, D.C., back with his old agency of the Health and Human Services. So it's not unusual to start a meeting where he would say, well, I just got off the phone with Dr. Tony Fauci, and we discussed this, that, and the other. Uh, because of the connections that Governor Thompson had, uh, which were very beneficial to all of us, we uh, were the recipients of a lot of resources from the federal government early on before other parts of the country were. We, in a lot of ways, were a model uh, for how the feds would respond uh, to COVID, primarily through testing. So at the time, we had uh, two kinds of tests, still do. We have the rapid tests or the antigen tests, which are deemed to be less accurate than say uh, the PCR tests, which are sort of the gold standard and, and considered to be very accurate in terms of detecting COVID, particularly those early variants of, of COVID. Uh, if you knew how to use um, the, uh, the rapid testing, it could be very effective in, in helping us uh, suss out or get a, get a bead on uh, what was happening at the university uh, through the use of serial testing. So in other words, if you um, frequently test students, faculty, and staff with the antigen tests, the rapid tests, even though they were considered to be less accurate, the frequency of the tests would prove uh, over time uh, in order to, to really point the way in the direction we should be moving. So that was the kind of testing regime we put together that uh, we were testing three, four, 500 students a day uh, for a long period of time um, at our uh, on-campus um, university-based testing center, which was Albee Hall. Uh, and then we would use the, the PCR test more sparingly for those tests for people who were symptomatic, as well as those students who uh, uh, were to fail uh, the antigen test or they was, the antigen test would come back positive, they would automatically get a, a PCR test. Uh, all of this was, was done primarily because we had early access to these tests from, uh, from, from Governor, Governor Thompson. And I, I would just, in this one rare instance, I would beat my own drum on this in that uh, if you look carefully behind me, you're gonna see science books. Uh, I'm actually a scientist by trade, a, a chemist, an analytical chemist. And I knew and understood the power of the, the serial antigen testing early on and at first, when the idea of the antigen testing was brought to the system, a lot of people had read articles in the New York Times suggesting maybe that it wasn't as good, it wasn't a good test, and therefore you should only do PCR. PCR is expensive, and PCR is also takes time to develop. Antigen testing is rapid, uh, and you could um, get the results right away. I saw the value in that, uh, in, in that um, I was the we were the first institution, UW Oshkosh, to step up and say, we want to use antigen testing as the primary backbone for our testing, uh, our testing regime here at this institution. Governor Thompson was very supportive of that. And so we, even within the early adopters, we were early adopters 
uh, in that way. So it's something that I think makes very good, a very good story here. We, um, moving on to uh, continuing the testing, we, uh, you see on the screen here a picture of the Culver Center, uh, which became a very uh, prominent part of our testing regime uh, about halfway through this, uh, this crisis. The federal government came to the UW through Tommy Thompson and said, we want you to open public testing and vaccination sites. Uh, and uh, of course, we were uh, one of the first groups to volunteer. Uh, uh, the nice thing about the Oshkosh campus at UW Oshkosh is very centrally located, easy to get to on bus lines. You can walk here, you can drive here, plenty of parking. Uh, we wanted to, to really step up as part of this Wisconsin idea and help out. And so that's exactly what we did. We opened up a community uh, testing and then vaccination center, uh, again with our, uh, our friends at Advocate Aurora, were the ones who were very helpful, the vaccination in particular, were very helpful in helping us do that. We had a, uh, a government contractor help us with the testing part of it, Advocate Aurora helped us with, uh, the, uh, with the vaccination part. Let me just give you a few numbers uh, that uh, from all, all of this testing, both um, on campus as well as the community testing. So this is just for uh, the year 2020, 2021 academic year. So this was last year. And the UW Albee Hall Testing Center for students and employees in alliance with Prevea Health, we administered more than 51,000 COVID-19 tests. So the university colleagues pitched in, and as I said before, with contact tracing, disease investigation, uh, testing staffing, uh, and other support for this, this what we call the Titans return effort. How are we gonna get students back on our campus? Um, UWO ran, opened and widely, uh, ran a widely accessible and successful COVID-19 uh, community testing center out of Culver, as I had mentioned. Uh, and federal partners, we administered more than 36,500 COVID tests to the community. So we definitely had a line uh, for many months there as we opened this. And when the vaccines became available, we partnered with Advocate Aurora Healthcare and we offered vaccinations uh, to the community. Matter of fact, we, we offered 19,400 doses of vaccinations uh, to, uh, the, to the community. So we were certainly one of the major providers of vaccinations uh, in this region. What I really liked about the spirit of all of this is that when people came to the vaccination center, whether it was the, 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 the public facing vaccination center or our, our, our university facing, we, don't, we didn't turn people away. Uh, we never turned people away. We wanted people to be vaccinated. So uh, what, as they came in, whether they had an appointment or the proper um, uh, um, um, documents that you would need for that, we worked with them to make sure that they received the, uh, the vaccination. Uh, that they really were entitled to. So um, I wanted to kind of talk about um, the, a lot of the things that we learned. We learned uh, a lot uh, through the COVID uh, um, crises. And one of the things we learned had to do with communication, uh, that uh, there's no such thing as over communicating anything. And this was, a, I think, a real stroke of genius from our, uh, our emergency operations center uh, in working closely with uh, certainly my office, uh, with uh, Chief Leibold, and uh, with um, University Communications and Marketing, uh, we had a communications plan that really did work hard to over communicate. Uh, we instituted um, online town halls. As a matter of fact, I just held one here this morning. Uh, we had uh, north of 400 people associated with that town hall. Uh, 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 certainly the topic that was on the, on the top of most people's mind was the Omicron variant and how we're approaching it and what are we gonna do in order to get students safely back on campus uh, in February when the, when the spring semester begins. So it was any number of, of communication, um, um, really venues and, and, and causeways, if you will, that we developed during this time. Certainly the online uh, town hall we did with our own people, but we also started doing town hall with parents. And that's, uh, that's an interesting experience when you have uh, parents ringing in, particularly at the height of, uh, of the original COVID surge. This would be back in, in March and April uh, of last year um, when we were uh, working hard to, uh, as students tested positive, we had the ability to quarantine them 
to isolate them in empty residence halls and we would serve them food. We provided medical oversight. Uh, we wanted to keep the students uh, safe, but more importantly, we wanted to keep the students in, student, uh, in class while they were uh, convalescing in these facilities. So you can imagine someone's mom calling up and asking some very, very direct questions about how we're providing care uh, to their student. And uh, because of the expertise that we were able to assemble on these calls, uh, it, it, it was something that was uh, very well um, uh, received by the parents and by the students uh, that they had. So we have to uh, remember and use what you have learned and experienced through. So the town halls are going to remain uh, as, as we do these kinds of things. Um, other things that I, I would say in, just in, in terms of just general leadership uh, attributes here in terms of remembering and using what you've learned is your own personal experiences need to be brought to bear uh, in order to do this. Part of my background uh, as I was introduced is I also ran uh, fundraising operations at a variety of different institutions that I've worked at. I was a chemist, but then I was a fundraiser. Uh, and uh, what you, the, the kinds of skill sets that I brought to bear there were the kinds of relational uh, 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 tools that I needed to, in order to be successful in this, in terms of bringing people together, getting them to work together on, on things that quite frankly didn't have to. Uh, there were a lot of what we did, of course, as I had mentioned before, had to do with uh, being uh, good volunteers. And so those kinds of uh, fundraising uh, techniques, uh, if you will, uh, were very helpful in that. Uh, previously in my career, I was involved in designing instructional laboratories for chemistry, uh, which was a lot of fun. And, and you got to work from a blank piece of paper and then bring, again, bringing people together to help to realize a common goal. And that's something that I think worked well in this, uh, this particular uh, instance here. Um, uh, I, I'm a musician, uh, just as an amateur musician. There's a picture of me playing a baritone saxophone in a, in, a, in a performance a few years ago here at the university. Uh, and I think that uh, just sort of relaying on uh, the, the, the traits, if you will, of, of leadership, that expanding yourself in different directions and taking risks. Uh, I can assure you, any of you out there who have performed publicly uh, in any kind of, uh, of arts or performance, know how literally vulnerable you are uh, at that time on a stage uh, and in, that really you really have to build um, a good deal of courage and uh, I would say um, a, a strength of determination in order to do these kinds of things. This of course is a, a much lower pressure kind of uh, event that you would see than, than running the pandemic response. But at the same time, I think it's worth noting that I hope that each of you are stretching yourselves in uh, different kinds of direction so that uh, you can grow. So I had addressed the, uh, the communications issues uh, previously here. The, the Titan returns plan was our plan that we had put together. This is the frequent emails and the posts and, and the different uh, kinds of virtual experiences that we provided. Uh, the town halls um, for students and employees uh, social media was also a big part of this, is getting the word out across the board um, on how we were going to um, continue to get the word out about the, the kinds of decisions that were made on campus that would impact students. Uh, uh, they say that you need to, to say something or, or provide something to someone up to seven times before they really, it really sinks in. And I, I would go ahead and double that for students. Uh, I think that... Uh, <laughs> you need to spend a lot of time over communicating with students in order for them to understand this. At the end of the day, uh, and I've given the credit many times to the students, the reason why we were successful in, in opening and remaining open and having a meaningful uh, educational experience was because of the students. In the end, uh, they followed the rules. Uh, they wanted to be a part of this. They wanted to be here. They didn't want to be online. If you remember the name Deborah Burks, uh, Deborah Burks, uh, of course, was an associate with Dr. Tony Fauci uh, in the Trump administration. She came and visited uh, Madison uh, and met with all of the chancellors and the, and the UW system staff, including Governor Tommy Thompson. And she remarked at the time that the reason why there seemed to be a very high level of compliance on campus, on college campuses, in things like masking and social distancing and generally following the rules is because 
the students themselves wanted to protect faculty. They wanted to protect uh, those of us who were uh, maybe not quite as, uh, as, as uh, healthy or uh, physically resilient as a 21-year-old student. Uh, and I thought that was a very, very sweet um, uh, sentiment uh, that uh, in a lot of ways, people followed the rules because they wanted to protect us. Uh, so in the end, I give a lot of, of credit uh, to the students for all the things that they have done for us. Uh, I think in this, cross, in, this, in this process that we went through, it's important to acknowledge the fear and the loss and the pain and, the, and to continue to acknowledge it. Um, it's exhausting right now. Uh, we're in our third major variant. Um, this variant appears to be uh, far more uh, virulent in terms of its uh, contagiousness, but at the same time, it's, it, it, uh, it does not appear to be as um, a deadly, if you will, uh, as the other variants that we have seen. So it's, it's, it's important that we, we never suggest that people's feelings are irrational or illegitimate. Uh, you know, and we, of course, face that on the whole issue of whether or not you should be vaccinated, uh, whether or not you should be masked. The issue of masking is pretty much settled here. There's no, there is no controversy uh, that when we ask people to put on a mask, they do. We don't get arguments about that. Vaccination is a little different. Uh, we uh, had a very successful vaccination drive here in uh, this last fall. And again, it was the, the brainchild of Governor Tommy Thompson. It was the 70 for 70 campaign where we wanted students uh, to, to be vaccinated, to be doubly vaccinated, uh, and then they would be put into a, a drawing for some very lucrative scholarships that were offered by UW System. As a matter of fact, we ended up giving out seven $7,000 scholarships at the end of this, and so it, it was profoundly impactful to those students who received them. So we had to get to 70%. And so today we're at about 75% vaccination of our students. And we're a little over 80% of our, of our faculty and staff. I don't expect those numbers to change much. Um, you know, I'd like to be at 100% on both of those scores, but there is, um, there's going to be a, a, a resistance to do that. And in the end, um, it's though I continue to encourage vaccinations, I, uh, I needed to move on. We needed to move on um, and um, acknowledge the fact that we needed to be able to work uh, in an environment where not everybody's going to be vaccinated. And so that's, uh, that's, that has to do with acknowledging or, or not accusing somebody of being irrational because they're not doing something. I think we need to work with everybody um, as you do that. Students, faculty, and staff have sacrificed a lot. And there's no doubt about it. Uh, financially, um, you know, as we moved um, in the early days in, into this pandemic from March of 2020, we sent everybody home. Uh, there was just a skeleton crew at the university. Students were dislodged from residence halls. They had to, they had to live someplace else. Uh, they lost uh, connectivity to um, our super fast internet here. Uh, they uh, lost a lot of that student experience our faculty were just nothing short of miraculous in that they were able to put everything online uh, in a very short amount of time. Um, and for the most part, were able to teach, uh, uh, finish the rest of the semester primarily online. This was less than ideal in many instances, but everybody made it work. Uh, and then I would say for our faculty and staff, there was the extra added measurement of the fact that uh, we had to furlough people uh, towards uh, the end of that particular spring from May until August, uh, we furloughed, or I should say I furloughed 180 individuals completely and that they were completely out of a job uh, for that time period uh, because we just simply didn't have work for them to do on the campus while uh, we were here. We are after all public sector employees and you simply cannot pay people not to work. Uh, so if there is no work, we can't pay people. So. That was a very uh, difficult time. And then I had to look into the eyes of many of those 180 people and say, I'm sorry, but we don't have work for you right now. We, we're gonna need to continuously furlough you. For everybody else, it was intermittent furloughs where uh, they basically experienced uh, about a 10% pay reduction in that they had to take furlough days um, uh, once a week um, in order to, um, again, uh, cut back on the, the number of hours that were available to be worked uh, simply because, um, you know, we needed to, to, to move through that. 
So uh, in the end, uh, we brought everybody back. Uh, you know, people often criticize universities for not operating more like a business. That's certainly an instance where we did. Uh, it was a very painful uh, time for us and certainly a great sacrifice to our, our faculty and staff who experienced those furloughs. So, so uh, another lesson I would uh, want to harp on here, and I, I know that my time is getting uh, is starting to draw short here. Don't discard every change you've shaped. Keep what works and remember the story. Uh, we're kind of in that phase right now. First of all, the, the online meetings that we've had where we have four or 500 people join are not going to go away. I used to do a lot of town halls in person where I would go to the campus and, and stand in front of the people. And I might draw a crowd of 60 or 70 people. Now I draw hundreds of people online. Uh, and so that's certainly a communication method, which is simply not going to go away. Um, our EOC is not going to go away. Uh, there's going to be continued uses for that level of expertise, even after the pandemic is over. And so that's an important, I think, to, to, to not necessarily jettison everything that you were doing um, as, a, as a point of, uh, uh, as, as the, the story finishes, if you will. So honesty earns alliance. Uh, this is very important. I, I have always told the full unvarnished truth every opportunity I've had uh, in addressing this, this, uh, uh, this crisis. Uh, and if you do anything short of that, uh, if people detect that you're, you're not being um, as forthcoming um, as you really need to be, uh, there's, you, you lose authenticity. And so that's very important uh, that when you're in these leadership positions, just give it to them straight. Uh, people can manage uh, the difficult news uh, that we have. Um, and they can also uh, will tend to uh, rejoice with you when the news is better. So uh, honesty definitely um, the, um, is a big part of this here. Good work speaks for itself. Uh, we've had uh, really a tremendous outpouring of acknowledgement uh, and recognition from all, all corners for the things that we've done here at UW Oshkosh. What I would say about UW, the efforts at UW Oshkosh is that, and I say this in some jest, that we were about 15 minutes earlier than anybody else on a lot of the things that we did. Um, higher education in general handled this, uh, this crisis very well. Uh, we were certainly out in front of it. Um, here you see a wonderful picture of uh, the Surgeon General Jerome Adams, who came on the day that we opened up the vaccination clinic to the community. There's Governor Thompson to the left. Uh, and this, the Surgeon General Jerome Adams uh, was um, very, a complimentary of the efforts that we were running here at UW Oshkosh and felt that we really were a national exemplar in many ways and, and the things that we were doing. Um, again, um, we have Governor Thompson, uh, who um, uh, never uh, misses an opportunity to acknowledge the good works that were done here. Um, he's visited our campus frequency, frequently, as well as uh, our current governor, Governor Evers. Uh, who was uh, always a, a part of big milestones in, in the COVID. Here he is um, uh, presenting having with the day that we opened up the community testing and the, and the vaccination clinic. Uh, here I am in, uh, this would be in a, the last February, February of 21, after I'd had shoulder surgery. Uh, it was not of action long, uh, but it was the same ceremony where we were able to acknowledge um, a lot of the good work that we had here. So, um, we have a, a lot of gratitude to uh, the people who helped us, as well as I know that there's been a lot of gratitude expressed in the community uh, for the, the role that we have played here. Um, and sometimes uh, we can be a, uh, at our best when things are at their worst. And that really is when you, you, you know who steps up and, and uh, how they're able to do that. And again, the, the students were just nothing short of miraculous in terms of, of uh, their compliance for the things that we asked them to do. Uh, the, uh, the faculty and staff, um, here's the, uh, Mike Germo, um, it was part of it. We had nursing students who worked with the National Guard in, in helping vaccinate uh, people here. And we continued on. Uh, the, the, for the most part, we wanted to make sure our students were having as normal uh, uh, an educational experience as possible. Uh, but we just did it in a way that kept people safe. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is some of my proudest moments of Chancellor have been during this time uh, that we were able to uh, come together and uh, really beat this thing back. We're not done, unfortunately, 
Uh, we still have another semester, I think, to get through before the, this really subsides to the point where we can uh, think about other things. Uh, one of my favorite pictures, uh, this was a snowstorm and a, a couple of Februarys ago, uh, you know, you've, you've seen the big dome here on the Oshkosh campus. Uh, and uh, it just, the, the problems just seemed so insurmountable when you began uh, with this process, but bringing the right people together, uh, letting them lead from where they're at uh, was really a, a critical component of the success that we uh, enjoyed here at UW Oshkosh. So uh, this is a picture later that day. Uh, uh, again, here I was snowing, uh, shoveling my own driveway. Uh, it's the only picture I have where I look like Yukon Jack. And so I, I just had to use it to finish this, pres this presentation. So just very quickly, what kind of university does this region need and deserve? This is something we're, we're being very introspective these days. We're working through a new strategic plan uh, to bring together uh, of the various elements of this institution, how to best serve uh, the region uh, that we uh, occupy. And again, uh, this is some of, one of my favorite pictures of all times, and this is what we do. We produce just thousands and thousands and thousands of graduates each year uh, that go off and do great things here in Northeast Wisconsin. So I wanna thank everybody. Uh, I think, I hope that there's some time for some questions. Uh, there may, may or not be. Um, it looks like we have a few minutes. Um, I'm happy to bring Amy back up and if she could moderate some questions. Hi everybody, this is Amy Reese, the marketing specialist here at Oshkosh United Way. Thank you, Andy, for sharing. What an amazing um, response you had to an unprecedented event and we really appreciate you sharing your experience. I have a few questions here. Um, let's see here, we'll start with, um, how did UWO compare to other universities in your response? Well, uh, again, we, we, we tended to be out there a little bit more. So for instance, there was only uh, two of the UWs that remained open after the Thanksgiving of 2020. Uh, all the other ones went online and it was UW Green Bay, UW Oshkosh, who decided to stay open. Uh, and we had the confidence to do that, even though we had similar numbers that other campuses had in terms of the uh, positivity rate, uh, but we knew that we could keep people safe and we believed in um, our work. And uh, I would also say the same thing for commencement last May, uh, that we were one of only two institutions that held a face-to-face -face commencement with an audience. Um, uh, here on our campus. And the other one, of course, was UW-Green Bay. It was Mike Alexander, who's the chancellor's there, uh, that we certainly did uh, quite uh, talk quite a bit. But uh, we, again, had confidence in our ability to, to keep people safe and, and, the, and the hold. So I, I would say you would find here at UW Oshkosh, or maybe over some of the other UWs uh, uh, at the time, now, again, everybody did an exemplary job of, of, of moving through this, uh, that we were willing... Uh, to take um, maybe a, a little bit more risk on some things because we were confident in uh, the, the plans that we had, the data that we were looking at and the people that were around us. Wonderful, awesome, thank you. Um, so the next question is, uh, you had mentioned a little bit about acknowledging loss, et cetera. How did you deal with the stress for employees and staff with you know, Osh the Oshkosh United Way finds mental health, that's one of our focuses. How did you deal with the mental health of your, your employees and your students? Uh, I will just say not as well as I, I wish I could. Uh, it, 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 it's a very difficult um, uh, a, a issue. As a matter of fact, that's going to be one of the resounding, ringing, continuing to ring issues after COVID is over is on how do we deal with the mental health issues. Certainly for our students, uh, we were in a better position in terms of the very robust uh, counseling uh, services. We actually brought on tele telecounseling as well. We we increased those uh, those uh, capabilities. We of course um, have our own um, uh, employee um, EAP program, employee assistance program uh, for the students. Uh, uh, there was within the embedded within the frequent communications was uh, the appeal for self care, uh, the appeal for pe people to know and understand what their limitations were and how best to um, help manage, have them self-manage, if you will, the situations they were in. Uh, 
so it's it's going to be tough. I think that this is going to ring uh, for the next few years of the mental health issues that have been created by this this pandemic. And I have one more question for you. Is there one thing you would have done differently and how would you approach it now? Yeah, there is. Uh, there's probably more than one thing that I would have done differently, but a big one is this. Uh, early on, if you recall, no one knew what this was, uh, what COVID was. And when those in initial closings happened in March of 2020, we didn't have a single case on campus when we closed the university. We didn't understand it, and no one, no one did at the time. Uh, the when we removed people from residence halls, that caused true disruption in the lives of many of our students. And I wish I had that one back. I wish that we would have made uh, exodus of the residence halls more voluntary. Uh, so those two students who chose to have gone home could have gone home. We ended up refunding everybody's money. So it wasn't an issue of the money. It was more the case that uh, we put people, um, you know, they had to then fend for themselves because when you move on to a college campus during the year, that is where you live. Uh, that's where you live. And so you, you want to make sure that uh, uh, that housing is stable. So if I had that one to do over again, I would have made a different decision. Okay. Well, thank you again, Chancellor Lovett. We really appreciate your experience and everything you shared today. And, and thank you for the wonderful leadership. A lot of the attendees are complimenting you on, on how you approach this and, and for your leadership. So thank you again for your time today. Uh, my pleasure. And again, it was an honor to be here uh, and I uh, wish everybody well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for attending. Have a great rest of the day.